States. The Royal Train arrives in Washington, and appropriately to the scenes which follow, let me leave Movie Tone's American commentator, Lowell Thomas, to describe the welcome to our King and Queen. In Union Station, they proceed to the reception room, where they're awaited by President and Mrs. Roosevelt. Friendly and wholehearted salutations. So glad to see you, delighted to be here. No stiffly starts diplomatic chill. American President and British Sovereigns, they and their First Ladies, like a party of friends. Vice President Garner is introduced, followed by a series of introductions. King and Queen shake hands with members of the Cabinet and of the Foreign Diplomatic Corps, a close-up of royalty at its royal task. A salute while God Save the King is played and the Star Spangled Banner. They have found something interesting to talk about. Easy and informal chatting is the keynote of this event of state. George VI shows pleasant anticipation of seeing Washington with its crowded streets. In the formal procession, King and President ride together. It's a warm day, especially for anyone wearing an admiral's uniform or formal morning clothes. Washington sunshine is bright and hot, as Queen Elizabeth's white silk parasol seems to say. Not like London, where 80 is a tremendous heat wave. In the Guard of Honor, the cavalry rides clattering on the pavement. The Royal Transcontinental Tour across Canada has been an immense success, creating a closer tie of Canadian allegiance to the Crown. Now this welcoming pageant in the United States signifies a promise of closer friendship between Great Britain and the United States. Washington receives the British sovereigns with a popular ovation. American cheers for a king. Washington gets a spectacular show. The parade down Pennsylvania Avenue. King and president talking. I wonder what about. As the cheers ring out. Hundreds of thousands watch, and there are vigilant precautions for the safety of their majesties of Britain. To assure their safety in such a public appearance as this, the United States Secret Service and Scotland Yard have collaborated. Secret Service men, on foot, following the cars. The White House, where the King and Queen are to stay as guests of the President and Mrs. Roosevelt. It's to be their home during the round of festivities in Washington. The first act of the pageant of royalty in Washington ends as they go in to luncheon. Then, to take up the story, in the White House grounds, a boy scout made a presentation to the king, a scroll and a box containing a shark tooth scarf. It must have been a proud experience for that scout as he shook hands with the King of England. 6,000 Boy Scouts and Girl Guides cheered the King and Queen as they drove away to attend the garden party at the British Embassy. On the terrace, the King paused to talk with Postmaster General Farley and his wife at this terrific social event which had been discussed in American newspapers for weeks. The great moment for the 1,400 guests was when their majesties mingled with the throng. The Queen, wearing a dress of white organza, hand-tucked in graduated wits, well, you can imagine how closely the American ladies observed her dress and how thrilled they were to talk with her. There's one who curtsied. It was terribly hot, and at tea time, nearing the end of her first day in the United States, the Queen found her fan a useful as well as a decorative asset. Next day, another blazing day, their majesties visit the Capitol, home of Congress. Just as a visiting president might be received by Parliament, so the King and Queen go to be welcomed by the Congress of the United States. Under the rotunda, they are greeted by Vice President Garner and Senator Bora, the famous isolationist. The Queen, still carrying her parasol, looks delightfully cool despite the temperature. 96 senators and 433 representatives are introduced, among them one woman, Mrs. Hattie Carraway. The scene of the reception represents a break with tradition. 
Never before has the rotunda where the body of Lincoln lay been used for such a purpose. But then never before has a British king visited the United States. And now a very significant journey is undertaken by the king to visit the tomb of Washington. He and the queen embark on the president's yacht Potomac where the president has already preceded them. Piped on board, the king immediately goes off to shake hands with Mr. Roosevelt, who inquires, how did you make out at Congress? It must be a pleasant change to be going for a cruise after the intense heat of Washington, and off goes the Potomac along the river of that name, with the Royal Standard flying at the masthead. Their destination is Mount Vernon, stately home of George Washington preserved nowadays as a national monument. The king and queen walk the paths trodden by that American general who defied the king's great-great-great-grandfather, George III. Now, 160 years later, King George VI pays tribute, which Britain endorses, to a man whom history proves to have served the cause of freedom. Moreover, the independence of America is seen to have been the inspiration of the principle which now underlies the British Commonwealth of Nations. So, in honoring George Washington, the king honors one whose precepts have blessed British as well as American democracy. There is a different perspective behind the other tribute which the king pays. Here at Arlington is the national memorial to the men who lost their lives in the Great War, a war in which Britons and Americans fought side by side. And the king's wreath is the offering of a comrade in arms.